Good evening. Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor. Um, I'm program director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. It is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to our online program. And I would like to express our appreciation to Archtober for their help in promoting this event. Uh, before introducing our speakers, uh, a quick overview of the General Society and our history. We were founded in 1785, the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, 235 years ago. The General Society since that time has been dedicated to improving the lives of the people of New York through our tuition free Mechanics Institute, our General Society Library, which by the way will celebrate 200 years in November, um, our John M. Mossman Locke Museum, and our wide range of educational, historic and cultural programs, which include the Artisan Lectures and the Labour Literature and Landmark Lectures, of which of course tonight's lecture is part of. As I just mentioned, um, we are having a very special event tonight and I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, writer Wendy Lubowicz and the photographer of the book, Ed Lefkowitz. They will describe their book tonight, 111 museums that you will must not miss, providing a treasure guide to the secret corners of the iconic museums. Uh, Wendy is a journalist and museum buff extraordinaire. As a private guide in New York City with a fine and decorative arts degree from Christie's Education in London, she takes clients from around the world to museums big and small. Ed is a commercial, corporate and editorial photographer and the photographer of another book in the series, 111 Places in Brooklyn That You Must Not Miss. He enjoys exploring New York City life in all its storied quirkiness. Never without a camera, he chronicles the cognitive dissonance that color life in the boroughs with his alternative website, The Quirky Side. It is now my huge pleasure to introduce to you Wendy and Ed. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Just pressing a button there. Hello, everyone. <laughs> There's Ed. Hi, Ed. Hi. <laughs> My name is Wendy Lubavitch. It's a delight to be here tonight. Um, when Ed and I did this project, it was um, probably um, two years ago now, about two years, um, we decided to visit uh, more than 100 museums in a single year. So we really did it in a calendar year. And the way we did it is I would sort of be the canary in the coal mine. I would go out first and explore all these various museums in New York City, big and small. We would select which ones we wanted to cover in the book. And then Ed would go out subsequently and shoot images based on maybe the angle that we took, that sort of thing. And we wanted to be very democratic about this. So we tried to have them fairly equally distributed between all five boroughs in New York City. So we went um, very far away and very close to home. So it encompasses the entire metropolitan area, which was really important for us to do that. And also we wanted to have a nice rhythm, a nice variety of the kinds of museums that we covered. We covered the big museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But when we cover a big museum like the Met, we try to go very small. So with a museum like that, we just honed in on one particular painting, uh, Lloyd says Washington crossing the Delaware and talked about maybe some historical inaccuracies in that work. And we also um, chronicled the very tiniest museums, the museums that you maybe never have heard of. So we go from the big grand museums along Museum Mile to the very small museums in sort of far flung corners of the city. So it's all encompassing and it's really in my mind kind of a lovely fabric of the museums and then a fabric of New York City in general. Would you agree with that, Ed? Is that what we did? Yeah, ab <laughs> and absolutely. It, it really is a, uh, a, a kind of omnigatherum of everything museum-like uh, in the city. 
And some of them you have never heard of. Some of them basically occupy one tiny little room, as you'll see later. Uh, and some are just the, the absolute blockbuster museums like the Met. So um, yeah, we try to cover it all and find something for everybody. And we love them all. So what we thought we would do tonight, because, um, well, the reason that um, we're here tonight is because I have completely fallen in love with the Mossman Lock Museum that's hidden on the second floor of the General Society uh, building. Um, Ed's going to talk about the museum specifically in a moment, but I just wanted to talk about the very first time I stumbled into that gorgeous building, tucked away, it's truly a hidden gem. I mean, this is why we love New York on 44th Street. And it's this grand building, it's sort of Beaux-Arts, it's Renaissance Revival, it's Richardsonian Romanesque, this grand building, you walk in with these extraordinary pillars, this sweeping marble staircase, you go just ahead and there's this extraordinary library. I'm sure most all of you have been to this library. I had never seen it. And I was completely blown away by it. It's this double or triple story. The, the stacks of books go up high. There's a skylight at the top. I mean, who wouldn't want to spend a day just perusing the stacks in that extraordinary library? So you had me at Marble Pillars an extraordinary library. And then to my surprise, there was one of my favorite museums in the whole book up on the second floor, the Mossman Lock Collection. And I'll have Ed take you through that. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Uh, this, this collection is really particularly intriguing to me. My, my dad was a machinist and I learned when I was in early childhood to appreciate all things mechanical, including locks. I learned to take things apart. Uh, put them back together and mostly successfully. I disassembled a clock or two and a couple of locks as well and a lot of other kind of mechanisms, large and small. So this, this really knocked me out. You know, we live in New York, so we are used to locks, right? Door locks, padlocks on, on store grates and, and shutters. Uh, and now we're used to uh, key cards and keypads. Many of the locks in, in the Mossman collection are timed locks. Uh, you can see by the clockworks inside these things, right? There are springs and they look like they look like clocks. They'll only open if you have the right key or keys. Some of them require two keys simultaneously, just like a, a um, safe deposit box in a bank. So, so you can't sneak back into the office at two in the morning, or your assistant can't sneak back into the office at two in the morning and, and even if you got the key and get in the safe, it's just not going to work. Um, I think of timed locks as kind of the mechanical equivalent of the poker player's motto. Trust everybody, but cut the cards. And look at the or ornate filigree work. Uh, the, the, especially in, in this particular case, the, the right one on the, on the middle shelf and the ones on the bottom, these are really, really, really ornate. Even the winding key on this one, right, is 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 ornate. And look at the look at that filigree. That stuff is on the inside of the lock. It's not on the face that you can see. It's not functional, right? Nobody had to put it there. But the locksmith was proud of his work, thought it would be a really good idea to add it, and you see the results before you. It's just astounding, astounding stuff. There's decorative casting on the inside, right? Here's this is an inside plate again. And not only the manufacturer's name is cast there, but look at all the decorative filigree casting. It's just astounding. So even, even if you don't care a fig about locks or anything mechanical, just look at the decorative art. It's just, just astounding stuff. So check them out. Wendy? Absolutely. We thought what we do tonight, because um, the Mossman is sort of clad in this extraordinary building, we thought we would focus on museums where the architecture plays a big part of the experience. Because to me, that's what was so exciting about Mossman is where it's set. And the setting said so much about how we sort of reacted to the museum. So the next stop is kind of a similar place. This is the National Arts Club in Gramercy Park. So it's right across the street from Gramercy Park, that exclusive little park where you have to have a residence along the way with a key to access the park. But this is an extraordinary Victorian Gothic revival building. This is a private club, but the secret is anybody can go inside. I didn't know this until I researched the book. 
anyone can go inside to see their rotating exhibitions. And this is the kind of thing you'll see when you go in, this extraordinary sort of this newel post with this goddess. When I look at her, I often think of, oh my gosh, the things she has heard over the years because of all the people, the great actors and directors and musicians who were part of this club, they would come here to dine together. They'd have award ceremonies in this grand sort of setting. And um, there was one time when I was there, they had um, works from their permanent collection on view. And there was a letter from actress Lillian Hellman. And she had written a letter to the board asking them to tell people to stop gossiping about her. So that just kind of sets the tone of the way maybe what had happened here. And the next slide, Ed, will show on the landing, you see all the different people who have won awards there. And so you really get a sense of what this club was like. And you literally feel like part of the club without paying any of the dues. So in my mind, that's a win-win. So what happens here is they have um, like many exhibitions throughout the year that rotate and they're on a variety of topics. Like it's amazing the, the different kind of ways that they explore. Um, one of them was sort of um, uh, black fashion in America. That's one that's on right now that I thought was fascinating. And then there's a textile historian who was launching, there's an exhibition there as well. Um, there was an exhibition on the United Nations architecture, and there was a cellist who was going to play a live concert. So um, right now with COVID, these are offerings that you can access online. As we know, a lot of the museums have sort of had to change their programming based on what's happening in the world. But it's amazing the variety of exhibitions in the four galleries there. And you really feel like a club member for a day. So an extraordinary experience. Now, speaking of libraries, this is the next one. This is the New York Society Library. Okay, now that is a card catalog, if I've ever seen one, right? I mean, I've never seen a card catalog like this. This is the New York Society Library. It's on 53rd Street and 79th Street, Upper East Side. And it's actually the oldest library in New York City. The General Society Library is the second oldest. This is the oldest. And George Washington was a member. Truman Capote was a member. Herman Melville was a member. So all these extraordinary people would come here to write, to research, to study, to be sort of a member of this sort of community of writers and thinkers and readers. And you don't have to be a member of the library to access this extraordinary place either, to my surprise. This is a reading room that's tucked right in the front of the library. So you can walk in and you can announce yourself and they have you sign a very old fashioned sort of book, very old school, you sign in with your handwriting. And then you're allowed to come into the reading room where there's just to the left of this card catalog, there's this gorgeous tooled leather desk with beautiful chairs, there's a fireplace. It looks right on over onto Madison Avenue and 79th Street. So you feel like you're really in the heart of the Upper East Side. And then look what you have, this extraordinary card catalog. So they're over 200 years old. So imagine all of the, um, the acquisitions in this library. Imagine the size of the stacks. So I think mostly they're online, but in some ways they still use the card catalog. But if you open it, whoops. whoops but if you Oops, open the right. card catalog, we'll go back. I'm there, sure. go. there we go. Here There's we go. that card catalog. There you, go. Um, you can see the typewritten cards. Many of them are stained with age. And what I love is you have that unmistakable whiff of old libraries from childhood. So I love that. But the other part of the, the New York Society Library is you can go up this staircase. And on the second floor, they have rotating exhibitions. Now these exhibitions are really like the antithesis of the blockbusters that you'll see at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the big grandiose exhibitions. This is namely probably just two tiny little cases, but they're so full of heart and they're so fascinating. It might be Edith Wharton's New York. It might be um, look at high tech books. It might be a look at extraordinary book binders from the Victorian age. And you take this paneled elevator back down to the, la to the landing and go back into the reading room. So this is again, one of those places with this extraordinary grand architecture, just like general society as well. And it's this private club where surprisingly it has public access. So this was one of my favorites as well.
back to me. Um, speaking of architecture, you know, religious architecture is really among the most ornate and the most beautiful. And, and to my eye, the museum at Eldridge Street with its Moorish architecture really ranks among the best. It's, it's truly world-class. The synagogue was built in 1887. Uh, it's in what is now Chinatown. Now visitors there ask a lot, well, why would you build a, a synagogue in Chinatown? But, but in 1887, that area on the Lower East Side was a Jewish community. The Chinese hadn't gotten there yet. So it's not, it wasn't yet Chinatown. So as the years went on, um, as happened in many places, the congregation shrank. They couldn't afford to keep the building up. Uh, and as the building started to decay, kind of from the top down, the congregation retreated to a basement chapel. Uh, and up here, windows were broken, pigeons came into roost, dust and dirt eventually covered the pews, the roof leaked. Uh, and if you go there, you can see photos of the uh, decrepit condition. You can see some remnants of the early, uh, of, of the early decay as well. Uh, then in the 1980s, a group got together that were determined to save the building or restore it. Uh, and after years of work and a whole lot of money, the stained glass window and the architecture were, were in fact restored. Uh, that included dismantling, uh, restoring and cleaning the hundreds of pieces that make up the brass chandelier. You can see it there. It is truly ornate and, and absolutely stunning when you stand there and look at it. Uh, and then there's that, that wonderful stained glass window by artist Kiki Smith. Uh, that was installed as well. Uh, so the building was designated a National Historic Landmark in uh, 1996. And uh, the restoration was finally completed 120 years after it was built in December 2007. It's a stunning, stunning piece of architecture. And I really, really recommend that you, that you go visit. Uh, it's closed now uh, because of COVID, but a lot of information is available online. So by all means, check their website um, and find out uh, when they're gonna reopen. I love that Kiki Smith window. Yeah, let's go back to that. Yeah, isn't it astounding? I yeah, mean, that really, blows you away. It, it totally blows you away and, and just glows there. Um, I love the modernity. I mean, it has a slight hint of modernity and yet somehow it feels like antiquity as well at the same time for some reason. Yeah. And it just blends in so beautifully with the architecture. It, it does fit in with the architecture. Um, the shape of it, the colors of it, uh, it really, yeah, it, it, it really helps make, helps make the, whole, uh, the whole building. I mean, if you look at the detail there, it's just astounding. I mean, the, 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 the painting on the wall, the, the, the woodwork, the, the ornate, uh, the pillars and arches, it's just an, an incredible, incredible piece of architecture. So we go from that to kind of uh, the opposite. This is uh, in the Tenement Museum. It's one of my favorite museums in the city. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, by New York's diversity. It's one of the reasons I moved here. And I'm fascinated by immigrant stories. My ancestors came here from Poland in the early 1900s. And my father lived for a while uh, when he was a boy in a tenement in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now, he told me stories of tenement life. Uh, but, you know, I was a kid. I didn't listen all that carefully. And I really couldn't understand what his early life was like until I went to the Tenement Museum. Uh, it's a real tenement house. It's not a reconstruction. It's actually two tenement houses. And it's not so much restored as kind of stabilized. So uh, it looks run down uh, because it often was run down. Tenements were built to house poor and working families, especially, um, especially immigrants just starting out and landlords squeezed as much as they possibly could out of, out of the spaces they had. The apartments are really quite small. 325 square feet often housed a family of five or more. Initially, they had privy toilets outside. Uh, and then finally, one toilet was added to, to the hallway on each floor, right? So think about that. The building at 97 Orchard Street had five floors. It originally had 22 families and it had a saloon in the basement. 
and one toilet on each floor. So uh, you gotta you gotta move quickly, I guess. So um, here's the kitchen. Can you imagine preparing uh, dinner for you know for a, a family of however many five, six, seven people in a kitchen like this? Um, that would be pretty tough. Uh, there's the coal stove, right? Um, you not only cooked on that, but you heated your irons for, for ironing. And in the winter, it provided heat. It must have been just brutal in here in, in the summertime. And the cooking smells really must have overwhelmed not only that apartment, but all the apartments on the floor. We like to think of, I don't know if we like to think of it, we think of, we do think of the gig economy and, and working at home um, as new things, right? But they're not. A lot of people, especially those working in the garment trade, worked at home. They were sewing or doing other kinds of, of piecework. Children were counted on to pitch in, right? Child labor laws weren't in place yet. Uh, this setting looks pleasant enough, right? With a sewing machine and the little scraps of fabric and, and, the, and the shears, but it really doesn't begin to describe the working conditions. For that, you have to take a look at photographs by, by Jacob Rees. The Museum of the City in New York has a really good collection of his photos, as does the Library of Congress, and you can, you can see them online. It was really a, um, a wretched place to live, a horrible place to work. The, the rooms were, were crowded when they were actually working on things. The entire rooms were, were filled with, uh, with work tables and, and, and people sewing and cutting and all that sort of stuff. So I recommend you, you really go visit the museum. Uh, it, it's, the museum is open, but visits are by guided tour only. So you really have to register and just check their website for tickets. But, but check it out. It's really, it's, it's an astounding, astounding show. Wendy? Yes, I love the Tenement Museum and the tours, the tour guides are extraordinary. They're wonderful. All right, so this is a different kind of architecture, the next place we're going to talk about. Have you ever been here? This is the Nevelson Chapel, which is in Midtown. It's located at 619 Lexington, so it's Lexington and 53rd Street. So um, this was created by Louise Nevelson. Louise Nevelson was an artist in the 60s and 70s. She would, uh, early on, she lived in Greenwich Village and she would scour the streets, sort of finding a chair leg, a molding from a doorway, something from a stool. She would bring these sort of pieces of wood back to her studio and she would paint them all either black or white and she would assemble them in these collages. So, and then she would often hang them on the wall. Sometimes they were three standing, you know, physical sculptural collages. So they sort of blend this idea of collage. Is it sculpture? Is it a painting? Is it a work of art that you hang on the wall? It's all of those ideas. And she would call them her environments. Well, in 1977, she was really at the peak of her game. She was in her 70s by then. I think she was on the cover of Life magazine. She was a well-known artist and she was also Jewish. So this church, um, St. Peter's Church, asked her to build the Chapel of the Good Shepherd. So she did. And she built this very small chapel in Midtown within this church. And she has six of her sort of sculptures that literally formed the chapel because if yeah one more slide let's go back Great. there we go you see there's just a handful of pews so it's a very intimate space but you're truly surrounded by these extraordinary sculptures i love that her quote of what she thought about her work is she said she sought to break down the historical dichotomy between life and art this idea of blending life and art what a lovely sort of idea to contemplate while you're sitting in this very small chapel. And it's sort of hypnotic. I always find, I'm, I'm a big fan of Louise Nevelson. I've always loved her work. The Metropolitan Museum has a giant installation of one of her freestanding forms. It's some, a space you can actually walk in that's all black. But these spaces feel particularly ethereal to me. It's this idea of these, uh, rectangular and elliptical and round forms that sort of butt up against each other. These undulating surfaces, this idea of the way that shadow and light play. 
And then right here, there's this idea, there's this suggestion of a gold leaf cross. So it sort of hints at this idea of a church, but it's slightly abstract as well, sort of attached to one of her quote environments. So she wanted this to be a space where, you know, haggard New Yorkers could go in the middle of the day and just kind of have a quiet moment to sort of contemplate the day and the lives. It's right next door to City Corp Corporation. I love the idea of people from that high rise building from corporate America going into this small chapel beneath their, um, their big building and sort of just pressing pause on life. Um, they were closed for a while recently because unfortunately many of these sculptures suffered a lot of damage, but they underwent a major renovation and everything is sort of back to normal again. Everything has sort of been brought back to its original form. Some of the paint had been chipping that sort of thing. They did a major um, um, campaign to raise funds and they were able to do that. So now it's back to exactly the way it was. And this is really the only freestanding environment that's still intact that Louise Nevelson did. So this is an idea where the architecture, we're talking about the architecture affecting the museum. This is one of those cases where the architecture literally is the experience as well. There you can see one of the environments. You can just imagine where some of these pieces came from. Maybe this was part of a chair molding, looks like something had cut, someone had cut something out of a jigsaw with one of those. So a wonderful place. Now, we kind of have the antithesis of that coming up next. There we go. This is something called the M Museum and it's spelled, it has a strange smelling, spelling, M-M-U-S-E-U-M-M. -M -M. This is an abandoned elevator shaft in Tribeca. So here we have not grand architecture like the General Society, but we have rather humble architecture in no less an alleyway complete with graffiti. Across from this, you'll see sort of the, uh, the stairways, the outside um, fire escapes. So you almost feel like you're in a CSI crime drama when you're in this little um, alley on, it's for Cortland Alley in Tribeca is the address. And what happened here is there's a man named Alex Coleman who set up a tiny, teeny tiny little museum in this elevator shaft. And the philosophy is his museum is he calls it object journalism. So he will choose various objects that seemingly objects from everyday life seemingly have nothing to do with one another. It could be a toy gun, a red high heel shoe, a soda can, a child's toy, a deck of cards. You think that these objects have no meaning and no connection. But oftentimes you'll see if you pay closer attention, they sort of um, together collectively based upon a theme. Some of the themes in the past have been personal objects of migration, objects people have taken with them when coming to America. Um, another one is called, is this modern slavery? Products that are made around the world in uh, horrible conditions or objects made by US prisoners. So oftentimes there's a societal theme that goes along with these exhibitions and they're open sometimes. So just a couple of people at a time could walk into this elevator shaft. Ed is tall, so Ed would have to duck his head to go into the elevator shaft. And they also have it closed up at night. And so you can go 24 seven and you see that blue door there, it says block door, there's some peepholes there. So when it's closed up at night, you can look through those peepholes and you can see the exhibition 24 seven. And alongside of it is a telephone where you pick up the phone and a curator has recorded a little bit of information on the exhibition that you are looking at in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. So this is what I love about New York City. I mean, we have these grand, gorgeous museums with wonderful works of art. And then we have humble, tiny, little, well thought out museums hidden in an alley. I mean, I think this is what, you know, researching the book, this was the most exciting for me is to see all of the diversity of these places in these little pockets of New York City. So check out M Museum if you can in Tribeca. This is the one that you bring the family to, like after you know, Thanksgiving <laughs> right. dinner, when we can all have dinner together, yeah. you know, you go for a walk and you, you'll, everyone will be talking about this one for weeks. Right, Ed? Absolutely. And, and let me back up two slides. That little thing, that little part on the right is their gift shop. So you can buy, 
so you can buy museum swag there as well. And coffee. It's, it's, it's got to be the smallest museum gift shop I've ever seen in my life. Well, it's the smallest museum yes. I've seen in my life, so it makes it makes perfect sense. Yes, okay. but a keeper. Yeah. It's a keeper. It certainly, yeah, it certainly is. Um, the last one I want to talk about is the Alice Austin house out on Staten Island. Um, Alice Austin was a photographer, and she had this little cottage right on the water in Staten Island. And from the from the back porch, you can see these incredible views of of Manhattan. It really is. Uh, it's one of my favorite museums. I, I've already said that I know about other museums, but it, but it's really true. I'm I'm very interested in historical. Uh, photography. I'm interested in historical uh, photographers as well. And um, she was she was just incredibly important, if if not well known uh, outside of New York. Uh, true to her photographic interest, by the way, she called the cottage Clear Comfort, uh, and it was designated a national landmark in 1976. And then that designation was later amended to include LGBTQ historical significance. So it, it's got a lot going for it. I've got a huge amount of, of respect for her. You know, she lived with another woman, which was outside the norm. She got interested in photography when she was 10 in 1876. And she worked in a tiny dark room in the attic of the house. Um, you can, they will sometimes let you up to, to take a look in there. And believe me, it's really tiny. I did some photography when I was 10 with a brownie camera. My parents at that point sent the film out to be developed and printed. Uh, I didn't have to go through what she went through. Look, when she started photography back then, there, were, there was no photographic film as we know it. There was no drugstore or labs to send it to. Photo negatives were made on glass plates uh, and the plates were coated with a sensitive emulsion. So she had to expose the photograph and develop the negatives herself. Uh, and originally they were printed by putting the developed glass plate in, in contact with photo paper, exposed in a, in a special printing frame to sunlight and then developed. So it was really, really a, quite a process. So as I said, she was a woman photographing when most photographers were men. And she schlepped, uh, that's a photographic term, by the way, to schlep. She schlepped a camera uh, kind of like this one, along with a bundle of film holders and each film holder holding two pieces of, of film or originally glass plates, one on each side and a tripod. It was almost 50 pounds of gear on a bike uh, by the ferry into Manhattan to photograph. So you got to give her kudos just, just for endurance. She was prolific, especially considering the limitations of the equipment of the time. Uh, there are over 7,000 images of her that, that, that are known. She came from money, uh, but she photographed immigrants on the Lower East Side. So she, and she was thus a, an early American documentary photographer. She lost everything in the crash of 1929. Uh, she was finally evicted from her cottage in, in 1945. So she gave her negatives to the Staten Island Historical Society, and then they were basically ignored until they, somebody stumbled across them in 1950 and gave her, gave her an exhibit at that, at that point. She died in 1952, and, and sadly, um, against her wishes, she and her, her loving companion of 53 years, Gertrude Tate, were not buried together. They'd hoped they were, but their families refused to, to let it happen. So a lot of her images are, are searchable on the Alice Austin House website. Um, they form a really, really rich visual history of early New York City, um, early immigrant life, and her personal life as well. So her life and her society and her friends and, and, and Gertrude Tate, that's, those images uh, all remain. Uh, the museum is open for a limited number of visitors at a time. So, so check their website to go in. I really recommend it. It's a great, it's a great trip out from New York. Take the ferry out and, and check it all out. At Staten Island, it's this lovely little gingerbread cottage right on the water. I mean, the architecture is extraordinary. You think that you're in Prince Edward Island. Like I was imagining I was Green, Anne of Green Gables on <laughs> Prince Edward Island. I mean, the cottage is extraordinary. And Ed, when she rode her bike um, with all that equipment on it to the Lower East Side, she was riding it in a long dress. So major That's kudos right. to yeah. her. I mean, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it really is an extraordinary story and, and a, a 
just a, a wonderful photographer and a, and a terrific woman. So that's a little glimpse of some of the places that we thought the architecture, the building really kind of affect the museum experience the way it does at general society. Um, and um, just a little note about what's happening with museums in the city now. Um, many museums are starting to open up as much as they can with limited sort of numbers of people being able to be allowed in at a certain time. So it's sort of an evolving landscape little by little museums are opening up. But one bright spot that I found during the pandemic with museums is that the online offerings were quite extraordinary. And I feel it's though it's really upped many museums gains going forward in terms of the kinds of things that they will offer going forward. Um, so they had sort of like behind the scenes tours, very like cinema verite with exhibitions. The Metropolitan Museum has started this wonderful idea of my Met. So they have all kinds of people from all walks of life talking about why they love the Metropolitan Museum and what ties them to the museum. So it forced people to be creative and to have museum programming that's very user friendly, which I am a big fan of. And so um, I think some of those ideas will continue going forward, which is very exciting. I'm sure they'll. I'm sure they will uh, continue going forward. A, a number of the museums' offerings online are absolutely extraordinary, and they they learned very very quickly how to how to up their up their online game. So there's a, a huge amount of um, of video material, some interactive material. Um, so if you can't get to the museum, whether because they're closed or because you're not, you know personally feel safe venturing forth necessarily, by all means, check them out online. There is a, a, a wealth of stuff available and I'm sure the museums are all going to continue their online offerings down the road because it, it's, a, it's a great resource and it, in the end, it'll bring people in. It's a bright spot, which we yes. all want right now. Karen, happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions out there. Uh Wendy and Ed, hi. Thank, there. Hello, thank you both so much. That was fantastic. From the quirky to the magnificent. <laughs> and, and we were really very touched that you featured the John M. Mossman Lot Museum. So thank you. Um, so we'll now uh, start taking some questions. And the first one is, um, Someone also asked, I, I actually saw this earlier, someone had asked about the, the, uh, the addresses of some of the locations that you featured. But of course, the best way to find the addresses is to purchase the book <laughs> in depth. And it's really very, and it's very, very well organized. Let, so. me, let, me, let me add to that. Uh, not only are all the addresses and opening hours, well, at least opening hours, uh, pre-pandemic pre or there, but there's also um, how to get there by, by public transportation, what to do in the area, you know, where to go get a bite to eat or something. Uh, and there are, there are also maps in the back of where all the museums are located. So if you wanted to hit a couple of museums in a day, the maps are right there. You can very easily figure out which one which one is near another. We try to make it user friendly. Um, so one page is one of Ed's gorgeous photographs, and then it's a full page of text per museum. So it's very user friendly, and every museum gets the same amount of copy. We're very specific that way. So we try to have it be a guidebook that you can just throw in your tote and easily go and explore on your own. So yes. Thank Great. you for that, Karen. Well, yes, well, that was that, that, that was the perfect lead in. Um, the question was the perfect lead in. Um, the, Robert Farrell uh, wonders, uh, have you got any particular recommendations for the Bronx? The Bronx, Ed, what are you thinking about the uh, Bronx? Well, there's the Bronx Art Museum. Yes. Uh, which is really, really well worth a visit. Uh, and there's the, uh, the Yankees Museum. <sighs> I was so surprised with the Yankees Museum. Like I didn't know, I mean, I, I do like baseball, but I'm not a baseball aficionado. I was completely fascinated by the Yankees Museum. It's so well done. They have all the historic pinstripes from the years and you can see the early uniforms that were made of heavy wool. 
So you wonder how they played baseball in those heavy uniforms. But I love the whole exhibition on the, um, the World Series rings that yeah, Tiffany yeah, made yeah. many of the, the trophies and the rings. Oh my gosh, it was extraordinary. I, I wasn't prepared for such bling. I didn't realize those rings were so big and I, 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 didn't think, I didn't expect to see those there, but that was great. And the Bronx Museum was a surprise for me as too. I really feel like that is a museum that really um, feels very much like a part of the community more than many of the museums I went to. I really felt like I was in the Bronx and many of the exhibitions there are always cutting edge. You'll always see something surprising. You'll always see something that makes you think Think. So um, those are two museums that are very different, but um, you know, it kind of showcase the diversity. Yeah, and, 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 and the Bronx Art Museum is very, very uh, conscious about being connected with the community. Um, I think, as I recall, I think you can get in for free. Uh, and they really want to bring the community in. So uh, I recommend it. Right. Well, those are great answers, and I and I I did quickly see a comment from Robert Farrell who asked the question. I don't think he knew about the Yankees Museum, so uh, that's there's a, a Mets that's a revelation. Too, just to be fair, <laughs> the Mets have a museum too. Yeah. So but that's in Queens. Yeah. Right. Very very important <laughs> to mention that. Yes. Um, why did this is a question from Rachel Ann Reading. Um, why did you choose to focus your text on the object pictured rather than the institu institution as a whole or the strengths of their collections? Repeat the question again, please. Why did you choose to focus your text on the object pictured rather than the institution as a whole or the strengths of your of their collections, it sorry, was, their collections. It, it was actually the other way around, uh, and Wendy can speak to that. Um, the, the focus came first and the pictures came second. Wendy? Exactly. So every museum we handle differently. And um, I'd like to think that we handle all of those components in every single museum. We'll, we will talk about the Broad Museum you know, in terms of its broad collection. And we might focus on a couple of things just to give you an example of what you might see there. So um, we try to talk about the institution as a whole, maybe a little bit historically, a little bit of what their mission is, but then we'll also uh, hone in on exactly what you'll see, a couple of the highlights that you'll see there. So it's a pretty round, uh, well-rounded, I would have to say, sort of um, look at every museum um, with all of the diversity amongst the museums. Would you say that's true, Ed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we can't possibly discuss an entire museum in, in detail in, over the course of a page. So you sort of give a brief overview. And, the, and, and frankly, the, the, the book is, it's about the museums, but it'll help you focus on one thing or one group of things in the museum rather than just going in walking in and staring at the walls and saying, now what do I do or where do I go? This gets exactly. Something, and, something and the music, go. and it's, you're right, Ed. And also we tried, I tried to write it. So it's very experiential. It's not meant to be like a textbook. It's meant to be like, this is what it feels like when you walk in the door. This is what you'll see, hear, smell, you know, that sort of thing. It's meant to be very experiential as if we're taking you by the hand, you're a friend of ours and you're coming along to these museums with us. That was sort of the philosophy behind it. Beautifully described. Um, and, and, and by the way, I don't, forgive me if you're getting a very strange angle of, of me, or maybe you're not seeing me at all. I have a little glitch with my iPad, so my, my apologies. I don't know what you're saying, but anyway. It looks great, it looks okay. great. Oh, okay. Well, so, oh, thank you for that reassurance. Thank you. Um, now, this is a really open-ended question. Can you touch on any of the other museums in your book? Perhaps you just both want to choose one each to, to describe. Wow. I have to say that I'm a big fan of the Frick. The Frick, to me, what's special about the Frick is that it's somebody's home. So it feels as though you are a guest walking into a home and it's hung in a way that it was originally hung. Many of the works of art are still in the same spots where they originally were hung. You see the furniture that the family had used. So it's this sort of um, immersive experience where it's not just the fine art 
the paintings, the sculptures. It's also the decorative arts. It's the furniture, it's the porcelain, it's the moldings around the windows, it's the textiles. Um, that's the kind of museum that I really love. It reminds me of many of the museums in England and in Europe. Um, I studied um, with Christie's in London and there were many museums, you know, that were very much like that. And I always feel like with the Frick collection, although it's very American and Henry Clay Frick was quintessentially American, um, I feel though it has a hint of Europe as well. Um, they're going to be closing up soon, as you might know, they're doing a little bit of a, um, an expansion and they're going to be opening up, they're going to be putting their collection in the Met Breuer right on Madison Avenue. So this oh, brutalist cool. modern building <laughs> with um, Rembrandts oh. inside. So I'm very anxious to see how that'll be. That'll be a temporary move, but it'll be exciting to see how they expand. Um, they're doing a very sensitive renovation. So I, I'll love to see on the other end of what it'll look like. Okay, I'm going, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go with with a completely different kind of museum altogether. Uh, and because I live in Brooklyn, uh, I'm going to go with the Brooklyn Art Library. It's a it's a small um, it's it's a small museum, and the the it's really quite quite remarkable in that they they give people who ask for them a, a, a blank sketchbook. They're all identical sketchbooks, uh, brown plain paper covers and, and sketchbooks. And whoever gets one of these can fill it out with sketches or whatever um, and, and then submit it, mail it back to the museum. The museum will catalog it, they'll scan it, they'll catalog it, put it on the shelf. They have over 40,000 sketchbooks, all accessible by anybody who comes to visit, right? So you can choose them randomly. You can go by theme. You can go by what someone may have done with the binding. You can you can look at them in whatever way you want. It's absolutely a mine of of creative stuff. And you know what else they do, Ed? They have a mobile van and they take the show on the road, literally. They'll that bring you know, thousands of books into their mobile van and they'll travel the country and stop at small towns and let you know people who don't live in Brooklyn access these um, sketchbooks as well. I really love that they have this outreach as well. It's, it's fabulous. I mean, it's, it's, it's democratic because you don't have to be a particularly good sketcher or, or anybody at all to, to get one. Uh, and it's just, it's an amazing, amazing collection. I had the Check best day there. I had the best uh, yeah, day. Yeah, isn't it fabulous? Yeah. Yeah, loved it. Well, that is a wonderful advertisement for, for both museums. <laughs> uh, Judith Graff wants to know, um, after the lady photographer lost everything in 1929, how then did her cottage get acquired and turned into a museum? Uh, that I don't know exactly. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with that part of the history. Uh, you can probably, you can check it out on their website at uh, the Alice Austin House. I believe the Staten Island Historical Society was involved. And um, right when she had lost all of her money in 1929, they kind of swept in and they were able to get boxes of these glass negatives. And they sort of took over, they sort of led the efforts at that point. <clears throat> And we're able to sort of establish it as a museum. Um, it's, it's really a marvelous place. I mean, if you've never even been to Staten Island, I, I recommend just to go to this little museum. And they work so hard to keep this museum going. It's one of these places that you just really want to go to and you want to um, pay your money to go in and see it because it's so important that places like this stay alive for so many reasons. And you can also peruse through many of her photographs. There's a beautiful porch yeah. where they have many of her photographs and photo albums. And you can see like there's an organ grinder and uh, with a monkey from the Lower East Side that she would have photographed. Many of the immigrants coming in and newsboy selling newspapers, um, little Victorian women in their bustles, you know, having a party. So you really kind of get a, um, a real life sense of what life was like and what her life was like during that time. So you almost feel as though you're a guest in her home, yeah. kind of looking at her work. It's wonderful. Fantastic. Um, Dor uh, Doria Colt uh, wonders, have you ever been to the Rene and uh, Shine, uh, forgive me for mispronouncing it, C-H-I-M, Shine? 
Gross Heim Museum? Gross. Yes. yes. It's yes, in the book. Like Heim. Right. It's the Heim Gross Museum, absolutely. Yeah. That's just on the edge of Chelsea. He was a sculptor, and um, that's a chapter in the book as well. And you feel as though you're walking into a, a French atelier. It has those um, skylights on the ceiling. And all of his tools are laid out as if he had just left them. He, um, he sculpted in wood oftentimes, sort of these figurative kind of turning sculptures, I would describe them. He was also kind of, he knew everybody in society at, at that time. And he traded works of art by many artists working at the time. So hung on the walls around his dining room table, you'll see extraordinary works of art that many of the artists working at the time, early 20th century. So um, that's a wonderful place. That's another one of those little jewels that you really want to pay attention to because they work so hard. They do wonderful programming. You really feel as though you've escaped modern day New York when you walk into that atelier and then go to the second floor and see his apartment where he lived, where everything is just as they left it. It's really extraordinary. Yeah, and I, did you like that museum too? I, I totally love the studio. Uh, his tools are there. A number of his sculptures are there. Um, one of the things that, that really struck me about, about the, uh, the studio was the floor is not only a wooden floor, but it's end grain wooden floor. So instead of planks laid on their sides, the, the grain at the end of the planks is facing up as, as old fashioned uh, butcher blocks. And the reason they did that was if you drop an edge tool on the floor on a, on a hard floor or on an, uh, a, a normal wooden floor, you might ruin the edge. But if it drops on an end grain floor, it may stick in the wood, but it probably won't break the edge. So he wouldn't have to sharpen them as much. That just knocked me out. I said, yeah, How did you this, know this, this guy is good? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a true photographer he gets the I, used to, I, I used to work with wood so yeah oh, okay fair and, enough <laughs> and, and, and I've sharpened a lot of chisels in my life yeah um, yeah it's amazing it's just, and the light is astounding in there it's just gorgeous thank you so many museums yeah. to visit and um now uh, Susan Schwartz wants to know, and this is a question I can answer, I know this is live now, but will it be available for future viewing? And yes, it will be. Um, all uh, attendees um, and anyone, in fact, anyone who registered will be sent the video link. So you will be able to watch um, this, this wonderful talk again. Brian Gill wonders, how many museums are there in NYC and how did you select the 111 best? There were more than 111. Um, I did a very broad search at the beginning of the project. I'd say maybe there were like 150 or something like that. So we tried to then sort out like some were duplicates, like there's two Ukrainian museums, who knew? So one became a full chapter. And then the second Ukrainian museum was mentioned in the tips. Um, and we tried to have a variety that cover um, big and small. Um, again, we wanted to keep kind of an equal sort of assortment amongst the five boroughs. And we wanted to have the, a diversity in the types of museums, sort of the, the, what they cover. So um, we just sort of set out to do the most striking ones that fell into sort of these buckets that offered the most sort of diversity. Would you say that's kind of how it worked, Ed? Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to make sure that there was something in it for everybody. Uh, and because the, the publishers constrained us to 111 museums, we just couldn't, we couldn't possibly do them all. Uh, after, after the book was published, more museums have popped up in New York. I can't remember, uh, uh, the poster house is one, there's uh, Fotografiska, I think is one. And somehow I have this recollection of, of hearing that there's a museum of language that recently opened up. So um, yeah, so, so keep your eyes out for new ones because That's an important point, Ed, to, to talk about. Um, every time we do a reprinting, we reassess. And if museums have closed, then we'll slowly start right. to add some of the new ones that have opened up. So it's sort of a continuing archive. It's sort of a living, breathing document, a snapshot of the museum scene. So at any given time, it's always current. 
we've already updated it several times with a couple of museums that's closed. We added the Museum of the Dog. I mean, that was yeah, news since right. we yeah, yeah. published. Or, or have moved. The International Center of Photography has moved. So, yeah. Yes. The Houdini Museum closed. Oh, no. Yes, he's moving no. into New Jersey. So there's going to be some stories that are going to be written at the end of COVID. Some, you know, oh, museums wow. are really struggling right now and need yeah. our support yeah. more than ever. So um, I'm surprised to see and, and thrilled to see that many of them still are hanging in there at this point. Yeah, yeah. So we're just kind of hoping that the winter's okay and they can kind of hang on a little longer. Here, here. That's a very pertinent reminder. Um, do you, is there an, uh, first of all, just to remind people that this book is, you can obtain it through Amazon and, and any good independent bookstore as well. Um, but um, Jana Lynn Illen wants to know, do you, is there an electronic version of the book available? There isn't an electronic version at this time. Um, these books are um, 111. It's part of a series that's published all over the world. This was the first time that they did 111 museums. Normally, it's 111 places all over the world. So um, at this point, they don't have an electronic version, but um, I'm not sure if that might happen in the future. Yeah, I have no idea what their plans right. are. Right. Um, how do you think uh, the virtual experience can differ from the physical experience of museums? Well, um, it's interesting you say that because, you know, if you're looking at a painting, let's say you're looking at a Rem the Rembrandt self-portrait at the Frick, and you can only stand, you know, a certain, especially with a Rembrandt, you can't get too close or alarms will go off. Um, so you can, you can view it from a certain distance. But what happens if you go online, you can zoom in and you see things that you would never in a million years see in person. I mean, you truly see the brush strokes. You see the gradation, the way the pigments change to sort of um, show the curve of a face. So it's fascinating what you can see online when you go super up close. It really adds to the museum experience. Um, I'm a private tour guide and I take people, small groups of people to museums throughout New York City. And I always encourage people to really look while you're there, you know, spend less time reading the wall text and really look at the work of art and sort of lose yourself in it. And then after you get home is a good time to go into the website and then get more of the facts, the who, what, when, where, and why, what year, what school is it from, that sort of thing. Those are the, the kinds of points that you can easily get on a website. Nothing quite beats looking at a work of art in person and allowing sort of your interpretations to filter in before you get all the absolute facts. Because you might find out that your initial gut instinct about a work of art is absolutely spot on. Oftentimes our first ideas of a painting, maybe when it came from the mood of the painting, the style of the painting is exactly right on. And I encourage people to sort of use their own eyes and interpret it themselves and then fill in the blanks afterwards. So I think in tandem, those two experiences can be extraordinary. That's a that's a that's a very interesting point, and 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 who knows there may when we get back to normal times there may be more opportunities for that kind of virtual look at works of art. Now it's um, it's getting close to seven, and there are still um, a number of questions um, that we have, and I just wondered what it's it, um, it, uh, how much would you two like to take. Um, a few more questions. We'll take a couple more, sure. Sure, sure. Right, okay. And I, I'm, and I do apologize mm -hmm. if we have not got uh, to your question. Um, does, uh, this is from Jeremy Woodoff, does the book include other house museums of the city's park department besides the Alice Austin House? We have the Hamilton House, <clears throat> way up in northern parts of the city. Um, we have several house museums. The Merchant's House is there. So yes, there are several house museums as well. Those are always wonderful to discover. Can you think of any others, Ed? Yeah, the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Birthplace. Oh, yes, the, that's a wonderful um, one. I'm trying to remember. There's another. Uh, Gracie Mansion is actually in it. Yes. Um, there's, an, there's another one that I'm... Uh, 
uh, oh, the, uh, the Lewis Latimer House. Yes. Um, yeah, there, there are one or two others as well. So yes. There's probably yeah. about a dozen, I, I would say, that are based in homes. And that's always an extraordinary experience, the Dykeman. The Dykeman isn't in it because we had something close to it, but I think it's a tip in the, in the museum. So um, I think, I feel as though the, um, the house museums to me are really important as well, again, because I'm very into decorative arts. So I love to see in situ um, the surrounding where the art might be hung. So not just the art on the walls, but also the furniture, the architecture. And, you know, the Tenement Museum, you could argue, is a, a home as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. So a lot of museums are that way. Yeah. And in my mind, those can be some of the best experiences. Yeah. Uh, Virginia Fling wonders, how long did it take you to compile? <laughs> Well, um, we pretty much did the project in a year. Um, I was in the compilation stage when I was doing the proposal for the project. And um, I've worked you know, in some museums in the city, so I've been in the museum world a little bit. And so I knew a lot of museums, but the more I asked around, the more I discovered. So it was really this sort of this broad reach that kept getting broader and broader and broader as we dipped our toe into it. Yeah. So um, it took us about, I'd say, a solid year to yeah. complete the project. Yeah. It took me a solid year to write the book. I would probably work two months ahead of Ed, and then I would give him a yeah. batch of museums, hopefully geographically yeah. close together, not to <laughs> yeah. be too crazy, that he could shoot. Sometimes we would be looking for a general exterior of um, a museum. Sometimes we would be looking for a general interior. Sometimes we would be looking for a very specific object that we decided to cover. Mm -hmm. So we purposely kind of broke it up that way. So there's a nice variety in the way that we sort of photograph and focus on the museums. But a solid right. year. It was a yeah. hard year. Yeah. 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 I bet. But we loved every minute of it. It was a dream project for sure. And it does really seem like it was a fantastic par partnership between you both, really marvelous. Yes. It was, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Laura Monig um, wonders if there's any outdoor museums, and she actually cites the Lighthouse Museum as an example. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't do um, outdoor museums. We decided not to do outdoor sculpture gardens. Um, I think of like the Noguchi Museum that has indoor and right. outdoor yeah. spaces. And um, so I think when you go to the Noguchi Museum, you can see these wonderful, extraordinary sculptures inside the museum. That was once a gas station, as I recall. And then there's also these little areas outside where you can see how these sculptures, these very organic sculptures sort of communicate with the outdoors as well. Those are different viewing experiences always. Yeah, very different. The yeah. sculpture indoors is one thing. Everything's kind of quiet and closed around. You can be very contemplative and up close. And then that, um, as opposed to viewing a sculpture outside where the sky is there and the birds and there's a plane going overhead, people are walking by. They sort of contribute to different experiences. Would you agree, Ed? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I love the Noguchi Museum, and I, I especially love the outdoor part. I mean, there's a, a kind of Japanese garden area, and then there's this other area with, with concrete block walls uh, around these giant monumental stone sculptures. Um, that's actually probably my favorite part of that museum. It's open to the sky and absolutely just a, a, an incredibly stunning and oddly relaxing place to be. Yeah, for sure. Um, Eric Muller wonders, have you been to the Fort Schuller Maritime Industry Museum in the Bronx? Say that word again. Uh, ha have you been to the Fort Schuyler Maritime Industry Museum? It's in the Bronx. Not you know, we, we haven't been there. Um, we did a couple of other maritime, there were several maritime museums, as I recall. So we had to sort of focus and we probably might have chosen another one for a geographic location because we were trying to even things out geographically. So oftentimes if there were two museums that cover the same topic, if we needed to have more to make it fair museums in a particular borough, we might sort of lean that way. So that was some of the decision making process. But oftentimes we'll give, you know, in a tip, we'll say, well, there are other museums. This other museum covers the same subject matter in a different area. So. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take three more, we'll take 
um, three more questions. If that's okay with you? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Um, this is from Michael Halloran. How many museums were in another structure? For example, the General Society Lock Museum, uh, with the m museum being secondary, not mm. the main reason oh. you would come oh, to the Oh, gotcha, society. gotcha, yeah. Well, the Nevelson oh. Chapel is in another structure. It's in a larger church, St. Peter's Church. So that's one example of a museum that's in another structure. Ed, can you think of another one? Yeah, that's sure. The, right the Houdini Museum is in an office building. It's closed now, but that was in yeah, an, yeah, that was an office building. Office building the, uh, the, museum, the Museum of the American Gangster is in a uh, theater building. Yes, um, exactly. The Holographic Museum is in a sort of a uh, the garden level of, a, of an apartment building, as I recall. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Well, several of them were, and those are always yeah. the surprises. Yeah. I, I'm so sad to hear the Houdini Museum is closing. This is one man who dedicated his life to collecting objects by Houdini. And um, you would press a button in this Art Deco building, you'd go up to the second floor and the museum would be there. I understand he's moving it to, you can, they probably still have a website up and I think he's moving it to um, uh, New Jersey. So he's gonna open it in another form, but it won't be in New York City. So we'll follow him and see what he does next. If yeah. he, um, if he opens in New Jersey, we might not be able to cover it because this is about New York. Right. But um, he's a very dynamic museum owner, as it were. He's very yes. passionate about it. So uh, Karin Sager wonders, what is the weirdest, or I'll interject, the quirkiest museum in the book? Well, the holographic museum is pretty quirky, right, Ed? Yeah, yeah, that's right up there. <laughs> <laughs> Holography, this yes. idea of a three-dimensional image sort of superimposed on a surface. It's sort of run by this man who calls himself doctor. I forget what it is at the top of my uh, head. Doctor Holography, I think. Or, yeah. Exactly. And he wears a white lab coat and he gives you a tour of this sort of haphazard building. And he shines this flashlight on some of these works of holography. He's one of the few in the world, apparently. You go down to this sort of mad scientist building and he lights up this cigarette where the smoke kind of curls into these forms that sort of lit by these holograms. So that was a very unusual experience. And I think the M Museum that we talked about earlier today, the one that's hidden in an elevator shaft in Tribeca, I'd say that's a pretty unusual experience as well. Can you think of another one, Ed? Yes, um, um, uh, the, uh, God, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the, the, the part of the Dia Museum, the one with the dirt. Oh, right, exactly. Um, oh, I'm blanking on it. It escapes me, right. It's um, where there's a, it's, so the Dia Foundation has this room where it was at one time an art gallery and it's just oh. this, the, the New York, the New York Earth Room. Exactly, this the New York Earth Room. That's out and there. you go up That's the in. stairs, and it's just this this dirt that fills an entire sort of room in um, in Soho that was once an art gallery, and it's nothing but dirt. But you smell the dirt, this moist dirt they have to like water it every week. And it sort of brings you to the country. It brings you to the farm. It sort of recalibrates your mind right there in the middle of Soho. And it's been there since the 1970s. I know in the, in, when it's really hot, I think in July and August, they remove the dirt because they're afraid of mold growing. Um, I don't know if they're open right now with COVID, but that is um, an extraordinary museum. I love to just surprise friends and take them there if we happen to be bopping around the neighborhood. And at first people are really reluctant, but I have to say when they leave, people end up really liking it. Yes, it's right near Spring and Mercer, yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's probably the quirkiest. <laughs> yeah. Right, this, this will be our, um, fi our final question. And, and, and you have partly already answered this, but any museums you wish you could have included but didn't? Um, I think all the ones that were open at the time that we wanted to include, we did. But um, with some museums closing, like I said, I was really excited to get the Museum of the Dog in there. 
Um, so that was fun to include in the latest um, yeah. edition we, that's in the museum. And again, we're going to always have our eyes open for new ones that open when new ones close. So it's sort of a work in progress, which is really wonderful because then we can, you know, just kind of keep the ball rolling as yeah, the museum we, we, landscape evolves. Yeah, Wendy and I are, are in continuous discussions with our, with our editor here uh, about, about where to go next, what to include, what, you know, uh, so we're, we're trying to keep on top of what's going on. Yes, we will definitely keep on top of it. It's been a fun project. What a fun it evening, has. Karen. Thank you so much for having Karen, us. Karen, yes, thank you very oh, much well. and the Society for putting this on. It was just, it's been, right. it's been fun for me. It, the thanks were all on our side. This has just been fantastic. And you were both, you know, so eloquent and informed. It really was just a fabulous lecture. And as I said before, you truly are a really wonderful partnership because you both, not only does Ed contribute his amazing photographs, but also your uh, inside knowledge as well. Thank and of you. course, Wendy's description of the museums is, 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 re is really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So we're absolutely delighted that you could have participated. And I think a reminder for us all that there will be, you know, when we will be going back to these museums and we look forward to, to that day very, very much. And in, an in, in the meantime, thank you for wetting our appetites. And I think um, our executive director, uh, Victoria Dengel, um, may come on to say a few words, uh, Victoria. Yes, hi, Karen. So, Wendy and Ed, thank you so much. Your, your passion for our museums, it, it couldn't, the, what you've transmitted to us tonight couldn't come at a better time. If there were two advocates for the museum, we're, we're blessed to have you. So thank you for reminding us uh, of all of these treasures. And, or as uh, Vanessa Hoheb, our dear friend says, um, how wonderful. Thank you for so solving my holiday shopping task. <laughs> I'll take 12. Great. <laughs> I'll take a dozen. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, just to say, um, we are making both of you our lifetime members. Oh, oh, oh cool. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. A sample of your library card, and we want to see a lot of. Oh, fabulous. Thanks oh, so I'm much. I'm so excited. I'm, well, I'm Thank moved. you. Thanks. Right? your next book here and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also to our I would like to also thank our uh, our audience to who we are very always very grateful that you continue to support and and come to our lectures and like I say every time and I was looking at some of the names there you know we really do miss all of you. We're here. We come to the General Society every day. We're waiting for you. <laughs> and whenever it's the right time, we welcome you back with open arms. And, and thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Just a, 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 fine, a final thank you. And thank you, uh, Victoria, for putting back so, um, so, so well. And I do think that Vanessa made a wonderful point because my goodness, what a magnificent gift this would make. And in fact, someone, I can see one of the comments, someone said that she's already bought it. So she didn't wait to say it. So, wow. so, thank, cool. so thank you for that. But really it was um, uh, uh, just a, a, a really uh, superb lecture. And we're really so delighted that both of you could be part of our lecture series. And thank you again to our audience for your support and for attending tonight. Um, I want to mention that the uh, next lecture will be um, Steam Heat Sustainability. That will be on Tuesday, November 10th. And we will have another couple of surprise lectures coming up that will be announced shortly. But in the meantime, so many thanks to Wendy and Ed, and I'm going to bid you all good night. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very Thanks much. So much. Our pleasure.